Pleasure being here. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Parag Bhamre, as Cornelius mentioned. Um, I'm a partner at UPD Research. Um, so UPD Research is a market research and consulting company. We are headquartered in Bonn in Germany. Uh, I myself, I'm based here in Dubai and um, I've been associated with UPD Research now for about 10 years or so. Today, um, I would like to give you some insights on the global PV markets, um, where we started, where we've come and where we will go in the future. But uh, before I go in, um, I just wanted to mention um, what kind of products UPD Research uh, develops, um, what kind of projects we undertake. So UPD Research uh, typically develops a lot of market research products, um, namely the Global Installer Monitor, the End Customer Monitor. These are primary research surveys that we conduct within global markets. Um, recently, we have also introduced uh, the Global energy transition matrix. Um, it's basically an online tool which captures a whole lot of information on global PV markets. Um, additionally, uh, the company provides various certification services, uh, the top brand PV seal for uh, companies within the PV industry. Um, it's quite popular with various manufacturers, be it um, the module manufacturers or the inverter manufacturers. And um, on another hand, we also provide certain consulting services um, to various clients. We've worked with um, several manufacturers in the past, uh, specifically in the PV industry, um, namely Jinko, Longi, um, J Solar, just to name a few. And yeah, this is basically the product that I was just referring to. It's the um, GEP matrix. It's an online tool. It captures information on more than 50 plus global markets. Um, so here we track um, what are the forecasts um, in, in PV markets globally. Um, we talk about um, what is the cumulated capacity, what kind of regulations are in place, um, new tenders which are coming up and we try to track the most important top news across the globe. Now I'm jumping in um, into my presentation and I'll try to keep the entire presentation short. I have quite a few slides. Um, I'd be happy to share those with you at a later point in time, um, but I'll try to run through the presentation in the interest of time. Um, so when you look at the overall global renewable energy capacity, back in 2010, um, the total installed capacity was approximately 1200 gigawatts. This over the last decade has increased or rather doubled to approximately 2,500 gigawatts. Now, when we look at this number back in 2010, a majority of this was actually coming from hydropower. But the last 10 years have been, there has been a tremendous increase in the capacities of wind and solar. So these two technologies have really caught pace in the last 10 years or so. Now, when we look at solar PV in particular, um, the solar PV installations over the last four years itself um, have grown at a tether of approximately 25%. And more and more markets all over the world are turning to solar PV. In 2016, the total accumulated capacity world over was approximately 307 gigawatts. This actually increased by the end of 2020 755 gigawatts. So I want you guys to sort of remember this particular number, 755 gigawatts. This is the cumulated capacity that we reached at the end of 2020, because this is a number that I'm going to refer to the end of my presentation to show you what kind of potential still exists in expanding the total capacities. So some of the major reasons for um, this growth has been a strong incentive amongst various governments across the globe to promote solar and wind. So I will specifically concentrate on PV. Um, so there have been a lot of tenders, a lot of schemes to promote solar photovoltaics. Also, um, when you look at the manufacturing side of things, um, there have been tremendous economies of scale and solar has benefited because of that. And there have been several technological improvements, especially with regards to the module technologies in the last two to three years, um, where we've seen significant increases in efficiency gains and power ratings of the various modules. In 2020 uh, alone, uh, 
despite the COVID pandemic, um, I think a lot of economies all over the globe suffered. A lot of sectors were badly hit, but um, the solar sector continued to grow even in the year 2020. Um, when we started off the year, I think we had made uh, very optimistic projections in terms of the overall capacities. And um, when COVID hit, especially the major markets such as Europe um, and so on, we had to dial down our projections for that particular year. But what we realized is that the growth kept happening. Um, yes, of course, there were utility scale power plants which got delayed, uh, but the European markets and also China um, continue to go at a very rapid pace. Um, I want to mention a case um, for Vietnam. Um, so Vietnam in the last um, year itself, so that's 2020, actually ended up installing about 10 gigawatts of solar PV capacity, out of which 9.5 gigawatts or uh, around nine gigawatts, sorry, um, was actually within the rooftop segment. So this was a tremendous increase um, of one particular country installing so much. China, definitely a big contributor to the PB market, um, installed a total capacity of 48 gigawatts. And there have been several glo uh, gigawatt markets in 2020 year alone, um, which have resulted into a total installed capacity of 125 gigawatts in 2020. Now, when we look at the manufacturing side, um, so we've seen 100 gigawatt plus years for the last four years or so, um, but the manufacturing companies have also kept pace with the total installations. So um, when we look at the total manufacturing capacity um, in 2020, so just the module manufacturing capacity, um, this has been approximately 165 gigawatts. And um, you have approximately 10 top module manufacturers, which today account for more than 80% of the market. So there is a lot of competition. Um, there are several tier two and tier three manufacturers um, with who will find it difficult to compete in 2021. And that's something that we have been working on, looking at the total manufacturing capacities and how the market's gonna go. So although the market's sort of growing, but um, the manufacturing uh, companies or the module manufacturers have been really trying to up the game and add more and more capacity over the years. Now, when we look at the various module technologies, um, I wanted to highlight some trends and I wanna highlight some uh, key trends. So what we have seen is that from 2010 till 2019, the efficiencies of the panels um, that are being deployed world over has significantly increased. So back in 2010, the normal efficiency of a solar panel was approximately 14.7%. And this number has significantly increased. And until the end of 2019, this number almost reached 19.2%. Panels which were introduced in 2020 or the end of 2019 um, have even gone further where the efficiency levels are now breaching the 21% mark. Now, when we talk about the second trend, the second trend is that a lot of the module manufacturers have started introducing um, larger wattage panels. Um, now, this is basically a trend that we are seeing across um, various segments. Um, it really depends on what kind of applications uh, the panels are being used for, uh, but this can primarily be attributed to larger wafer sizes. Um, the wafer sizes are today, um, are today the companies which are using them, they are either M6 or M10. And um, some of the wafer manufacturers have even gone in for 210 mm wafer sizes to make these panels. And the wattages that we are now talking about are upwards of 400 watt peak or even 500 watt peak. There are various other technologies. Um, so PERC um, has become mainstream. Um, various manufacturers are trying um, with the heterojunction technologies and some high efficiency module manufacturers are even going with the IBC technology. Um, these kind of panels are primarily suited for rooftop applications. Um, we can safely say that um, the transition from multicrystalline to monocrystalline 
has all is almost complete. Um, yes, there are a few cases where companies or the downstream players are still using multi-crystalline panels, but uh, due to investments by very large companies such as Longi and so on, um, I think the transition towards monocrystalline is almost complete now. And uh, like I said, most of these panel manufacturers are now moving into various um, application-oriented uh, TV production of PV modules. So um, various companies are concentrating mostly on the residential or commercial and utility, and there are various drivers within these segments. So for example, in the residential segment, um, you know, the downstream players or the end customers are really looking for high efficiency panels, um, which are lightweight, aesthetically pleasing and so on. So that's a very different segment and the various companies are targeting their products specifically for various different applications. When we look at the um, module pricing, um, so the module pricing obviously has gone down significant. So the pricing has gone down significantly over the last couple of years. Um, and we've seen approximately a 33% reduction in the panel prices just in the last two years. And um, overall, if you look at the um, costs of solar PV um, from an LCOE perspective, where we were 10 years back, um, I think we've seen approximately 80 to 90% reduction in costs. Um, so as Cornelius probably had mentioned, he had also mentioned, you know, we can expect about less than one cent, uh, maybe in the years, in the next year or so. Um, I think we are already starting to flirt with that particular idea. Um, and a lot of developers will uh, kind of tend to agree with that. Um, however, um, I think this was the positive part of things, um, I think, but when we look at the solar PV technology, um, we have one hurdle that we need to uh, take into account. And um, that is with regards to the capacity factors for solar PV compared to the other forms of energy. So um, the problem here is that, yes, of course, solar is intermittent. Um, it can produce energy only during the day. So vis-a-vis -vis other forms of energy uh, where they can support base load capacities, um, solar PV is not quite there. So just from an LCOE perspective, yes, um, the technology is becoming competitive. Uh, we are reaching grid parity. However, when we take into consideration the, um, the, the comparison against nuclear or coal or so on, um, there are certain disadvantages. The average capacity factor of solar PV is somewhere in the range of 25 to 30%. And this really depends on where the plant has been commissioned um, and so on and so forth. So um, the numbers vary significantly depending on where the solar power plant has been commissioned. So in um, sunny states within the US, um, this percentage can go as high as 30%. Whereas in Germany, for example, where the irradiation levels are lower and the output of the solar power plants are lower, um, this could be somewhere between 10 to 15% only. So this is a challenge that um, solar PV has. And um, this is something that we will have to deal with um, through things such as storage. So um, storage is basically one of the, um, you know, it's, it's a complementary solution to solar PV. Um, and this is primarily due to the intermittency of PV. And uh, hence, we do believe that storage technologies will play a critical role in the global energy transition. So this is definitely apart from uh, green hydrogen that we've been talking uh, about since morning, but storage will play a significant role. Um, the roles are very different, uh, green hydrogen versus um, storage. So storage, um, you can use it for short-term um, saving of this excess renewable energy. Um, it, the applications could be as wide as the um, time shifting or let's say um, self-consumption of um, renewable energy, um, just power reliability kind of applications or um, energy shift um, just to uh, ensure that you, know, you use the time of day tariffs um, uh, to sort of leverage that. So there are various applications, but um, the basic difference is that uh, this is from a short-term perspective. Um, and this could really help. Whereas green hydrogen, you have much larger applications. 
To give you an example, um, you know, the United States um, actually currently has about 21 gigawatts of um, storage capacity, either under planning or um, either in the financing stage or whether it's commissioned. So um, we're seeing high levels of penetration within the Western uh, states in the US, um, for example, um, California and so on. And uh, we're seeing a large number of projects which are just being contracted, um, especially to take into, especially to cater to the um, services that I just spoke about. So I won't go into details, but um, we do have a long list of all these projects um, which are being undertaken. Um, but yes, we're getting there. So um, we are at least to a certain extent um, on specific days getting towards 100% renewables. So uh, this is just the start. Um, on specific days, for example, in Australia, in South Australia, um, where the demand um, was completely um, catered to by renewable energy. Um, so this happened during the last week of December, 2020. Um, and there have been many instances, even within Germany, um, where we've seen that the total uh, demand was actually met by renewables. Uh, but this is only for a specific time frame. I think the overall goal is to um, cater to the entire demand from uh, renewables for a long periods of time. So where are we right now? What's the status quo? Um, in 2018, um, renewable energy, so this I'm talking from a global perspective, um, renewable energies accounted for approximately 25% of the total electricity generation capacity. Out of this 25%, 16% um, was hydroelectric, right? So um, like I mentioned, solar and wind have just started gaining steam um, over the last decade or so, uh, but compared to other forms of renewable energy or other forms of energy, there's still a, a very small proportion in the total mix. Um, and coal, on the other hand, um, in 2018, um, still accounted for approximately 38% of the total generation capacity. Now, if we were to take into consideration what are the, uh, you know, the stated policies world over um, until 2040, and we just sort of sum it up, um, this, entire, uh, this entire graph or this entire bar will change where we say, where we would uh, assume that the global P accumulated PV capacity would reach 3,200 gigawatts if we were to just take into account and assume that all the stated targets would reach, would be reached by the year 2040. Now then, but there is another thing to it. So there, the various countries are even going and, um, you know, um, declaring their sustainable development targets. And if this target is to be reached uh, by 2040, um, we think that the total cumulated PV installed capacity globally would be approximately 5,500 gigawatts, which is definitely miles apart from where these, uh, where we are today, right? So I had initially started off the presentation by sort of telling you what where we've reached over the last four, four years. Um, and that number was 755 gigawatts. Um, however, if all these targets were to be reached and we were really to make that transition towards the 100% sort of renewables, um, the total installed capacity would have to reach 5,500 gigawatts by the end of 2040. And this is where the opportunity lies for a lot of global solar stakeholders. And um, so basically I'm sort of looking at it from an analyst perspective, uh, but even the stock market is sort of resembling that. So if you look at the um, stocks of some of the major companies um, which are active within the PV segment, um, well, their, their performance has been uh, extremely good over the last year or so. So some of them actually had a return of 233% um, across an ETF, uh, the Guggenheim ETF. Um, so this has been tremendously uh, great um, for the investors vis-a-vis -a, -vis a total increase of approximately 16.3% uh, 
on the S&P 500. That's the average return that they are getting on the S&P 500, whereas the solar stocks have been buoyant um, the last year or so. So in summary, I would like to say that, you know, there are certain amount of challenges uh, that solar PV will face. Um, the world as such is going through a huge transition. Um, and I think in addition to all the other buzzwords that you hear about the other industries such as AI, um, machine learning and so on, um, we definitely believe that utilities will be one of those segments um, which will see a tremendous transition over the next 20 years or so. Um, and there are going to be challenges in its way. Um, so that might be integration of renewable energy capacity, things like grid flexibility and so on. But I think what's really going to be important and challenging is basically the interplay of renewable energy, other emerging technologies. Um, it might be virtual power plants, green hydrogen, um, energy forecasting, smart grids, and so on. Um, and the interplay of all of these sort of technologies um, will be the key to solving our problem towards the global energy transition. Thank you very much. So well, thank you very much. If you allow a question, sure. You know, uh, first of all, I think uh, this uh, in, in, in 20 years, uh, a tenfold uh, capacity that will be much higher. But faster. Yes. As we have seen in the last 10 years, uh, if, if 10 years ago someone would have asked you the question, what kind of capacity and PV do you think it will be today? Yes. You would have said maybe, uh, maybe 50, maybe. Uh, but okay. I have a question. You had a very nice picture on the, the storage, the different types of storage. Is Can you show this picture? Yes, sir. Because this is my whole courses. Uh, <laughs> because, and you say it rightly, because storage becomes very, or all kinds of storages. I was looking at one of the most important storage uh, potential or the flexibility providers in this region, or in the MENA region, it's, it's a cooling, yes. it's a cold storage. Where is it in your boxes? Because I was looking for it and I didn't see it. Mm. <laughs> I'll check that, but um, I think it, this is basically from a global perspective, so it's not uh, specific to MENA, uh, okay. but yes, I mean, uh, regionally it would be uh, slightly different. My, my advice to you, put it in. And give also connect over uh, Valeria, this is a great sheet, this is very, because as you say, this is, this is a, a, one of the key issues in the coming decades, this is the whole story. In, along the whole value chain, storage so connected to uh, production, connected to conversion, connected to uh, trans transport, transport engine, sector, yes, uh, connected to loads. Yes. So I think um, I do have that transport section here, yeah. um, and I think this is again going to be extremely crucial. So yes, I think there is going to be electric vehicles, but then also or something uh, like hydrogen or fuel cells. Super, super. Thank you.